Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 15 of Maker's Mic, a music maker's podcast presented by LR Bags. I'm really excited about our guest this episode. He's the legendary Texas troubadour, Robert Earl Keen. Where do I even start with this guy? He's released almost 20 albums, toured alongside his pals Lyle Lovett, Guy Clark, and Towns Van Sant. And his songs have been recorded by George Strait, Joe Ely, The Highwaymen, and countless others. We were very lucky to have him come by our Nashville studio and record a few new songs for us. The Unknown Fighter, which you'll hear at the end of our interview, Silver Spurs and Gold Tequila, and a cover of John Prine's Hello in There. Be sure to check out the videos on the LR Bags YouTube channel. Now, without further ado, Robert Earl Keane. That'll be fine. Wouldn't be the first time. (laughs) Is that uh, that comfortable for you? Oh, yeah, I'm perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah. Got a nice setup here. Oh, yeah, I love it, man. It's it's yeah. it's really convenient. Is that is that your European mount deer, or did that just fall in here? Yeah, I don't know, the antique mall or. Oh, okay. Uh huh. Yeah. I like the European mount. Yeah, yeah. Tell tell me about uh, you dropped some new ones on us today, huh? Uh-huh. Tell me tell yes. me about the songs that you just did. Well, um, the first one is called the uh, Un- Unknown Fighter, and it's uh, really a, a song that I wrote. Because um, my daughter was boxing a lot at one point, uh, not like professionally or anything, but that was what she did, like for exercise. And she had a guy that was a professional boxer, and I and he was, you know, like a featherweight guy, but he was really, really good. And I, you know, just kind of uh, paid attention a little bit to his career, and I just, I don't know, that I just thought that that would be a kind of a, you know, good kind of Rocky comes back sort of uh, yeah. song. And um, I, I, it was it was it was fun. It was like all really good songs to me. It didn't take very long to write, and I uh-huh. and things fell in line really well, and I, I had a good time. Uh, and it it was also um, uh, out of my um, comfort zone because I, I really truly write sort of rural, sort of picture pictorial kind of songs, and that was m- much more urban than I ever write. So I was happy to kind of like. Get kind of an urban song. Of course, it doesn't have an urban beat or anything, but right. it does have that urban narrative. So, yeah, that was cool. Uh, the other song was a John Prine song that I did for uh, the BMI Troubadour Award, and uh, it was just I thought we did a when we did it when he got that award, we did that at the BMI Award, and um, and I just thought it was a really cool little arrangement kim came up with that little real quiet mandolin piece and it's yeah. you know it's so delicate and that song's very delicate and it's very sad in m- many ways yeah and uh i just felt like it was a really you know as a cover i think it's a really cool cover uh and then the third song um uh, it's called uh, silver spurs and gold tequila and uh it's you know, you know a love song and uh and it just has that real sort of uh you know, thinking by yourself kind of way in your own head, sort of thinking about, you know, someone that you love and lost. So, uh, and, and that one was, uh, I don't do a lot of co-writing, but I wrote that yeah. with uh, Adam Wright, who lives uh, in Nashville and uh, is a friend of mine and is a really good writer. So that was a song that we wrote together. Cool. What is your what's your songwriting process like? Like, do you typically kind of start with a, a melody, or or do you do, do, is it more story based? You know, I have been doing this so long that I uh, I tried I've tried everything yeah, it, re- really. Uh, you know, I one t- one time I took off all of my clothes and I laid in the middle of the floor. And I strummed the guitar until I came up with this really goofy song called The Great Hank, which is uh, this oddball perspective on Hank Williams. And then I, it has nothing to do with some kind of weird, weird, kinky thing about <laughs> I have with Hank Williams. It was just what came out at the time. Um, and, you know, I've written songs going down the road, just singing to myself. Uh, a lot of times those songs are really on top of some 
other melody, and then I go and, and change the melody, you know, uh, with the guitar later. You know, being fully aware that I'm singing on top of somebody else's melody, yeah. And then I just go go and change the melody later. But it really, I would say the tried and true method that I have would be uh, probably about as easy as it gets. I just sit on a chair or a couch and I strum the guitar and I listen to the sound and I uh -huh. sort of let my brain just kind of go different places and find a picture. I'm very cinematic in my in the way that I write. And I also uh, really like narrative things. So stories and all I need to do really when I'm doing that, sitting in a place playing the guitar, all I really need to do is, you know, find a great setting in my head. And I start with that and then yeah. I go. Uh -huh. it, it seems like you're pretty loose with, uh, you know, your themes or, or you write songs about everything. I well, I believe that I, I, I believe that songs, you should write songs about everything. I mean, to, I don't know. I, I, I've never really been. Never really had what one would call a hit song. I've had people cut a lot of people cut my songs yeah. and things, but I don't think in terms of if w would somebody cut this song. I just I really think in terms of what would be fun to write or what what if, what would be a real challenge to write. You know, yeah. like a like a you know a pretty uh, a, a, some kind of narrative where there's quite a few characters and. You try to work through some really good uh, uh, changes between your, you know, your bridges and your choruses and things. Those are, you know, challenges. So I like to write those kind of things. But then at the same time, for a while, I was writing these like ninety-second songs that I called snap chat songs, which were really fun to write because they just they would just they had one message. It just it, I just would say one thing basically, uh -huh. and then the song would stop. So. Um, I think of songwriting really as just having f fun. Uh, right. When I think in terms of like, I have to have a song, I, I almost always go blank. Uh -huh. uh, you know, so I'd yeah. much rather always think in terms of just having some fun. Uh huh. Yeah. Tell us about your. Uh, tell us about your callings. A guitar you played today. Well, uh, the one I played uh, today. Um, with those songs is the callings that the, my original callings. Uh, I I'm not I'm I met Bill I guess in 1978 or 79. We were really good. I lived in Austin from about 80 to about 85, and we were really good friends. And we we hung out a, a, a lot. I mean, and we you know got real close to getting into some real trouble a few times. <laughs> And um, at the time, Bill was uh, either working on his own or he's working with Mike Stevens, uh, who's a, 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 primarily makes basses but made all kinds of guitars and stuff. Lives out in Alpine, Texas now. But uh, so um, I always brought my guitars. I had a couple of a uh, couple of Martins, and I think I had a Takamini, and I had a couple a couple of guitars. And I would take them and get them repaired. Well, when Bill really got serious about making guitars, and he moved over to um, this little loop off of South Cong South Lamar in Austin, Texas, I went over there with I think one of my with my Martin guitar, and I said, actually, one of my Martins was one that he sold me, and I <laughs> brought it to him. I said, you know, it's the you know it's not tuning or something's wrong, and, and he says, I'm not fixing it, and I said. Well, what am I supposed to do? He says, you're supposed to buy one of my guitars. I said, well, okay, great. I'll buy one of your guitars, but like now I need this fixed. He says, no, I'm telling you, I'm not doing it. I'm, I'll, I will fix my guitars that you buy from me till forever. I don't, I, if, I, if, they, if you buy a guitar from me, I will fix your guitars for you. Yeah. I, but I'm not going to fix any of these other guitars. And so I said, well, great. Okay, fine. So... Uh, you know, we talked about what kind of guitar um, that I would, you know, that I would like and, um, you know, put that one together. That one was, uh, it's a smaller body guitar. I don't yeah. know what he, he calls it a C10, right? Okay. He calls it a C10 and it's really patterned after one of those L4s or L5s or something, a Gibson okay. guitar. Yeah, yeah. And, uh -huh. uh, 
it's kind of what some people would call a parlor guitar. It's a little bigger than that, but it's that yeah. sort of shape. It's a really nice guitar, and I want to say it over the years, it just, you know, the more you play it like good guitars do, the better it sounds. Yeah. I never got to meet Bill. I'm, uh, I've met Steve, and uh, I just I love what those guys do. You know? Uh, you know, Bill and Steve, well, number one, Steve McCrary is a, just a, a, a wonderful guy and, a, mm -hmm. and and almost a guy that you worry about because he works so hard. I mean, he's always working. This guy's always working. I go late and the whole place, you know, they have 60 or 80 employees. The whole place would be gone like Sunday afternoon and there would be Steve working, right? Yeah. And I'm like, do you ever take a break? And he, <laughs> he, he works so hard and um, – he he is such a big part of Bill's success as well because he's the one who kept Bill from giving his guitars away. Bill was like a kind of a like a guy that had the opposite uh, skills of a real negotiator. Yeah. Like for instance, that guitar I told you about that I bought. I bought this 1946 uh, O. Uh, 18 from from him uh, uh it was a martin right and he says you like martin so yeah i said yeah i like martin so he goes you want to buy this martin and i said i i don't know bill how, how much uh, 450 dollars. i said well you know i mean is it does it is it good if i'll take three i'll take uh 425 i said well okay how does it have a case he goes 400 and i said <laughs> does it have a case he goes okay 375 i said I don't care if it has case or not. I'll, uh, 350 I said, stop. stop. Just stop <laughs> with that business right there, and I'll buy the guitar. So I bought that guitar from him, and that's that was his style. He was just extremely yeah. generous and a really big-hearted guy, and he really didn't think about money and really keeping it together. So when Steve came into that that business he had to tighten the ship it was it made a, a huge difference the, um and his longtime uh guitar guy that's really sort of the uh, i don't know what he is he's like uh, kind of the guru uh bruce uh, is also the huge part of that yeah. company mm -hmm. i mean and bruce has been with was with he's still there but he was with uh, Bill, from the very beginning, when he really started making, you know, Collings guitars. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. I really want to get down there and check the place out someday. Uh, it's so fun. It's really fun. We were down there uh, recently. Um, I've been trying to get them to make a, a really wide, thin neck guitar, and I have one. And they they were like, "We don't know if we can do this." It was, this is a 1935 Washburn that I have, mm -hmm. and it's and they but they measured it and. Uh, we went down there with, uh, and we met uh, Tyler Childers down there, and hung ar around with him. And I never met with him, yeah, and he was yeah. great, great. Uh -huh. You know, we had a really fun time. And then we went over to the Salt Lick and had some barbecue, and then went back. And uh, and and Tyler had this guitar. He, I think, he bought it up in Chicago. It was a slot head, really wide neck, twelve fret. You know, and I've been talking to him forever. I've been, I want a twelve fret slot head, and they were like, "Yeah, we'll get you one sometime." I was like. How did he get that? And I don't have one of those. Anyway, so we were laughing about all that business. But uh, they will, you know, pretty much make anything that you want um, if you really know what you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, I read about some of your favorite venues in, in Texas, like Floors, and uh, but I wanted to ask you about some of your uh, other favorite venues outside of Texas. Mm -hmm. First, specifically in Nashville, where what's one of your favorite places to to play or to see a show maybe uh well i like uh third and Lindsay. it's really great uh play i played there one i played there i believe twice maybe uh -huh. i think i just did kind of a cameo but then i, I did a songwriter night with uh, uh with with uh, adam wright and Tracy berg and uh, uh waylon Payne. yep and uh and you know it's it's that nice you know kind of pretty funky but warm and good sound yeah, kind of place yeah. that you like to play. And then, of course, you mean we play our Christmas show every year at the Ryman, and who doesn't like the Ryman? Right, yeah, I, yeah. I'd like to find the yeah. person that doesn't like the <laughs> Ryman. The Ryman, even if everything goes wrong, you're in this just kind of magical place with all this, all that music that has been played all those years. And, you yeah. know, my wife and I ran – Hat show print when it was on Fourth Street, right across from the. No way. Right, yeah, we ran it uh, in 1986, and so and so uh, 
it was on Fourth Street then before it even moved, and it was right across from the Ryman. So I would go there at lunchtime, and it was two. And this is before they had brought music back into the Ryman. Yeah, yeah. It was $2 to go in and hang out and look at the museum kind of stuff, just look at the pictures and yeah. walk around the whole Ryman and stuff. So I'd go in, and after a while, they got where they just waved the $2 and sit there and eat a sandwich. And So wow. I'm a big uh, – I love the Ryman, and, and that's that's that was – that's always been uh, one of my fav- favorite places. But, you know, I played, you know, played the exit in. I'm not sure there's a place that I haven't played that's been around long enough. I mean, the Bluebird, you know, and uh-huh. all that yeah. business. Station Inn? So, uh, Station Inn, play the Station Inn. <laughs> I had a, I had, yeah, I'm going to really tell one on myself, but <laughs> I, had a, I had a record release party at the Station Inn. And, you know, I'm all dressed up. We got this record coming out, and I forgot what it was. It was a good record, too. It was West Textures, which came yeah. out in 89, right? It was a really good record. That was and a big one for you. Yeah, it was yeah. a really good. And it was the it was the publicist and myself, and no one showed up. And it was like, <laughs> I mean, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. You know, yeah. this is like, we're going to have this. You know, you know, I was really proud of the record. I made it with Jim Rooney, you know, and Jerry Douglas is on yeah. there, and Mark Howard is on there, and 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 uh, uh, Roy Husky Jr. You know, played the bass on there. Jonathan Yudkin. We had great, 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 great players on that record, and uh, and it was a, an exciting time for me, and I was really happy with that record, and had some really good songs on it, and <laughs> went to the station in. Nobody shows up. So then there was another time that I was playing at the station in, and I met this guy in Washington, in in Seattle, and I was playing some shows with Guy Clark and Towns Van Zandt. And afterwards, we went to this bar and we hung out. And this guy said that he was a salmon fisherman, and he said that he was, you know, like he'd say, send me some salmon. Yeah, right, sure, fine. We're all drunk and we all say anything, yeah. right? So we're all drunk and saying anything. And I go home and about. A month later, I get a, one of those like FedEx boxes with dry ice and huge salmon, no and, in, way. and in one box was separate. It said, "Please take this to Mr. Clark." And I was like, "I live 890 miles from Mr. Clark. You know how am I going to do that?" So anyway, I guess I didn't have anything to do, or I had a gig pretty soon there, uh-huh. and so uh, and I had it at the station inn, and I invited guy there. And I gave him, <laughs> I called him up on stage and gave him this salmon. <laughs> and it, I mean, I'm talking about a 20 pound salmon. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh-huh. <laughs> so that was, you know, one of my crazy. The station in for some reason, seen a lot of great shows, huge bluegrass fan, you know. Yeah. But I want to say for myself, Never something, treated you something, that well. something always went wrong, is what happened. It's actually, it's just one of those deals. That's man, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. T- tell me a little bit about uh, Guy Clark and and Towns Van Zandt. Like some. Well, I was going to ask you some of your favorite stories or memories about them, but I, I think we just got a, a gem of one right there. Well, one of my favorite things about t- t- Towns and Guy was uh, I I started. Uh, I'd, I'd had some different people booking me, and I and I and I we used to take Keith Case to lunch about once a month and beg him to book me. So finally, uh, Denise Stiff, who worked for him at the time, with, who's a booking agent, who later became uh, Allison Krause's manager, uh, calls me up and says, "I want to book you." Keith said, "It's okay." I said, "Great." So all of a sudden, they put together this little package where you know it would be Guy and Towns, and I opened up for him. So, and it was really good because Towns never had a driver's license. And so I could do some of the driving and things like that. But uh, we would, we went all over. And it was a time when Towns really had quit drinking. He just drank beer and he claimed that. Uh, that uh, drinking beer, you know, like you couldn't get drunk off beer, right? right. So which is technically really, sober. Yeah, and so which kind of rang true in a really weird way. Uh, they made that this movie, Hell or High Water. Did you see that movie? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. and it starts out with a town song. If I had a dollar bill, I'd go to town, surely would, right? And later on in that movie, the the good guy, bad guy, the anti-hero, right, yeah. guy opens a beer and he says, and his brother says, I want you sober for this. He says, 
No, nobody gets drunk off beer. You can't get drunk off beer. I thought, wow, Towns would have clapped for this guy. He yeah. would have loved this guy. So anyway, Towns really, he really didn't really get drunk. And there wasn't all that stuff that people always talk about. And I saw so many great shows. I saw so, I mean, and watching Towns perform was like not really and I don't want want to make it sound like like you know it was otherworldly but I've never seen anything that had the same effect on me mm-hmm. as watching him when he was good because his words and he really had a really kind of weird but good sense of rhythm and his guitar playing it all just kind of would sink in and I swear it was like you got to you got to open up a door and walk into town's to brain and see all these words going around, you know, and just swirling around, and those yeah. that beautiful music. And um, I saw a lot of shows like that, and it was really, really had a huge effect on me. Yeah. And then Guy came out, and, you know, Guy's, well, I was always the consummate showman, really, in the way that he did it. He got out there, he was always, you know, playing these really good songs, and people really like it. But Towns was a lot more... I don't know. It was more. It was there was more kind of a almost religious experience to it, you know. Yeah. What would you say is one of your favorite aspects about about being a musician? Like, do you do you like the performing part, or do you like the um, being in the studio or the songwriting? What would you say is probably your favorite? If I had to pick one, I'd probably say performing. Um, mm-hmm. It was the it was the thing where the light bulb came on for me, you know. I learned how to play the guitar, and I could right. you know I play like I play, but I play you know, and I you know I love Norman Blake, right? So I play, I listen yeah. to Norman Blake and try to be Norman Blake forever, and learned all his songs and try to you know try to be a flat picker, and it was terrible, yeah. but I you know, I, I, but I learned how to play, listen to those records, and then I started writing these songs and putting these songs together, and that was that was good. But then when I really got up on stage on my own, not with like a little choir or like a a bunch of band guys, you know, and I got on my stage on my own and stood up there and sang, it just all came together for me. And I realized at that moment, I I realized there was going to, there was, this is exactly what I want to do. I mean, up to that point. I was kind of secretly wanting to do this, and yeah. I, and I uh-huh. could, and I, you know, felt I could do it. But it wasn't until that moment, standing up there by myself, singing a couple of my own songs, that I realized, man, this is what I want to do. So really, I'd say the performing is truly the payoff. Uh-huh. Your first gigs were they well received, and did you? I don't even know, you know. I just it would go up there. It would be like some kind of, it, it would be some kind of open mic situation, uh-huh. and you know, I I just went up there and uh, there was a there was this uh, there's this book uh, with, uh, I think his name William Kennedy wrote this book called Ironweed, and they made a movie with Jack Nicholson and Meryl Streep, and there's this and there's this great yeah. great scene in there where she's kind of like delusional and they're both they're both like homeless they really it's like it's about poverty abject poverty right okay and uh there's this scene in there where she goes into this bar and she's singing and there's all these people in there and they're all stunned at how beautiful she's singing and how beautiful she is and how wonderful it is and all of a sudden the reality sets in and it's just her and there's nobody in the bar and it's just her and her singing sort of out of tune. Uh-huh. And and you and that's kind of what I, I always feeling. think of as like like I didn't care, you know? It's like yeah. here's a bunch of people or here's a bunch of, or there's no people. As a matter of fact, there's a point one time I played in this place in Austin, Texas, where I brought this little Panasonic cassette player player and I had I had recorded all this clapping. I think it was from Frampton Comes Alive, and it was all this cla- clapping and, and I would I would I would push it push it on pause right. and then I would sing a song and then I'd push the pause button and it would go off and I had a microphone on it. <laughs> so it comes through the PA and go <laughs> <laughs> and then I push pause again, and then I play Start another playing. song. So I guess it just didn't didn't matter. That, that doesn't mean yeah. that I don't love people having a good time. Yeah. But being there on stage feels like that's where I'm supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, it was just more of an experience for you. And yeah, yeah. Right. Um, you mentioned uh, Tyler. Um, I wanted to ask you about who who are some of the like young up and comers that that you're really excited about or. or... Well, I love I love Tyler. I I when I heard Tyler, I think I heard him on a radio station when we were going through Knoxville, and it was one of those cool stations that plays a lot of bluegrass, and I like bluegrass. Yeah, and uh, they uh, they and they played uh, that song Purgatory, and I was just and I just I just nearly freaked out because I was like, finally, thank God, somebody wrote a new great bluegrass song it's a great yeah. great bluegrass song and it's you could tell it was i didn't know who it was but i knew it wasn't like one of those old stanley brothers songs or anything it was right. like a real brand new bluegrass song that has all those elements that bluegrass has you know and it was really great and then you know i got you know and and then it got m- more into it and listened to more of it so uh and then i can't really i can't really put my finger on what it is but he, as far as I'm concerned, he has it all. I, yeah. He has it all. I don't. I don't know anybody. I haven't heard anybody in years and years and years that had it all. I, I mean, just I don't know. It's just really great. But uh, uh, you know, other people that I love. I, I love the. I love the white buffalo man, Jake. And I love. Do you know the white buffalo? I don't. Oh man, come on. So anyway, yeah. So anyway, he's a California guy, and okay. I guess I guess the white buffalo. Uh, he says he used to open up for us, right? Okay. And he's this big hunk of guy, and he's got long hair. I mean, longer. I mean, just like man. I mean, the guy has just got. Total, he just totally balls to the wall. I mean, he just he says what he thinks. His songs are really cool. It's and, and he's got a really great voice, a real low voice, and but this great vibrato. And so I've you know become a, a fan of. Uh, I I was a, sort of a fan just because I just like the way he held the crowd. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could hear some of his songs on Sons of Anarchy. So oh, okay. so yeah. there were a few of these. Uh, so we would play these shows. This is a few years ago, and he would be opening, and all these sons of anarchy Does he draw like the kind of the biker, yes, tough yes, biker crowd? right, yeah, right. And they could give a shit about me, right? But they were really happy to see him. But he was so cool. He was always really cool, and I thought he did a great job with the crowd. And his songs are really cool. So I, I just became, you know, uh, just a I'm just a a fan of you know. You have to listen to it, but you'll get it. Yeah, as soon as I'm gonna you, check them out as soon as you hear it. And and a lot of it has some real. It's uh, a lot of it has some um, uh, uh, you know real acoustic based sort of thing. You know, so uh, you get you get to hear a lot of really really well played acoustic guitar uh, things. Um, and uh, you know, as far as that goes. I could, you know, keep thinking, but you know, I'd kind of start running out. I, yeah. I, I have to say, uh, this guy's not new, but he's just one of my favorites, and nobody knows him. And I think he's just one of all-time greats in the world of like just writing a song. And it's, uh, this guy Adam Carroll, and he writes these just the coolest songs, and they're so easy, and they're so real and heartfelt. Is he uh, a Texas? Yeah, he's a Texas guy? guy, but his thing is not really. He is like, say, like if William Faulkner decided to be, become, <laughs> had okay. be, uh, decided to write songs instead of writing novels. You know, okay. his stuff has this great, like, really cool, cool kind of narrative quality, and uh, and I like his songs a lot. What What advice would you have for someone trying to um, start out a career as a musician uh join bmi or ascap i would i would say join bmi um because they are uh they are in the business of helping people who write songs if we're talking about songwriters there that's what the, that's what they do so you do that i would also say um one of my favorites is uh do you know the reckless kelly guys uh, you yeah. know, like, yeah, Willie. Well, not personally. But, yeah, but anyway, yeah. Willie and Cody, Braun, Mickey and Gary. Well, their dad's name is Muzzy, you know? And Muzzy's advice, I always love this, is is like, like always keep your publishing, always play the melody. Yeah. And I would say, I would add to this, his publishing thing, is like, 
always get reversions on everything that you sign. It's like, okay, this is fine. I'm all fine with this, but in five years, I want this all to come back to me. You know, so so I'd get reversions on everything. If you want to know about musical stuff, um, I, my best advice is, you know, if it feels good and you love it, don't let anybody. Don't let anybody. I'm as good an example as of anybody that to say that I just it's sheer will and I love it and I stick with it and uh and you know like I don't know what my talent level is but I know that that's once I decided I wanted to do that that's all I wanted to do and no one dissuaded me and I had I still have people telling me ah, yeah, yeah whatever you know so and uh you you can really do what you want in this life, but you you yeah. gotta you gotta hold on to it. Yeah, yeah, because you I mean you'll find your people, you know, or they'll right. find you. Right, you know, if absolutely. You keep at it, right? Yeah, yeah. You get your audience. Um, yeah. uh, man, you were recently inducted into the Texas Cowboy Hall of Fame. Yeah. Well, there you go. That's, See, there's a good example yeah. right there. I'm not a cowboy, but like I, you know, write these cowboy songs. I do a lot of stuff for, you know, certain cowboy groups. I show up at a few different things, but. Yeah. Um, and you certainly have to be a Texas promoter. Right. Or, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So I, I do that. Um, and, and I would say, you know, like, uh, but, you know, I'm in there. I'm in there with people like Phil Line, who was like two or three time all around champion cowboy that means that he he rode he rode bareback horses he rode saddle bronc horses he rode bulls and he and he roped calves and which is like almost every possible thing you can do in rodeo and he won that two or three times in a row yeah. and he's truly one of my favorite sports figures because the, after the second or third time anyway the last time that he won it he quit he went back to the ranch and that's where he is today that's he never he never did anything else. He didn't get any sponsorships. He didn't do anything. Yeah. He just went back He's to like, the well, I did it. Yeah, <laughs> went to the back of the ranch. So I love that. But he, there's these amazing people in there. Uh, if you if you've ever followed rodeo, and I followed rodeo when I was a kid. Uh, I mean, I'm kind of I kind of feel like um, like that little kid that's going. Really, am I'm not supposed to be in this picture, but I am. So there yeah. you go. I went to a rodeo and. Yeah, I, uh, I mean it comes here occasionally. Um, I went to one in Cody, Wyoming, and it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. It was well, like, see, there's a place to go. Yeah, yeah. So I was I was on a road trip, like on a great American road trip. Mm. You know, I was out for five weeks, and uh, with my wife, uh, we weren't married at the time, but uh, we were on our way to uh, Yellowstone. And we were driving by, and it was getting dark, and there was this huge venue, and it said, Rodeo, tonight, 7 p.m. And we looked down at the clock, and it was 6.50, and we just turned right in, and we were Perfect. like, we're going. Yeah. And it was amazing. Yeah. And we ended up getting into Yellowstone at like 10 o'clock at night, and it was super scary and like foggy and setting up our tent and worried about bears, but totally would do it again that's it fantastic was, yeah it was amazing and and you know the uh one, one of the things about like what you're saying there with with rodeo uh the environment uh where you get to see it like that to get to see it like in the west yeah it really feels like you go back in time and yeah. it's just fantastic uh -huh. yeah yeah it's really a great great thing. it is a great environment um I I was reading about uh the striker brothers uh-huh oh yeah that was kind of fun you guys sort of uh released this album right uh -huh. and 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 no one knew no one knew what <laughs> what was the what well, was the motivation for that we were doing uh randy rogers and yep. i were doing a, a a little a piece little video piece for floors country store for their 75th anniversary and this was in 2017 and uh so we set this we did this at this place that uh, we used to live on, and there's a big field, and we set this field on fire. And I mean, like a big field, right? We set it on fire, and I mean, these flames are like 
20 feet high and stuff and took a bunch of pictures, some really great pictures and stuff. And 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 they had a couple of photographers there, so we got some really great angles on yeah. that stuff. And so we started making these jokes about we ought to have this band called the Arsonists. So then we started laughing about, you know, that wouldn't it be fun to have, a, you know, kind of a different kind of band or just like a fake band or whatever kind of band. So I thought about it for about 10 days, and I called Randy up and said, we need to do this arsonist thing. So he said, Randy's one of those, you know, kind of all-in guys real quick. You know, he's decisive is the word, right? Yeah. And he, I said... He said, yeah, sure. So we got together and wrote, I don't know, we wrote five songs in a day and a half, and then we then we wrote a couple of more, and then we pulled in some songs that we'd written with, uh, you know, like on our own or with uh-huh. other people, yeah. and we made this record, and we just decided that it was, we the arsonist was a, like trademarked to all hell, so you couldn't do that. So we came up with the Stryker Brothers, and he's Flint Stryker, and I'm Cole Stryker. <laughs> and then we came up with this narrative about how somebody found these tapes at the bottom of this burned out prison, and you know West Texas somewhere. Yeah. The album's called uh, Burn Band. Right? Yeah, Burn Band, yeah. right? Yeah. And so we had, so we put this deal together, and the you know the big the 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 difficulty was not telling anybody. So. Uh, like I said before, I did get drunk a couple of times and told a few friends of mine. I don't think they really passed it on. But anyway, it was pretty amazing how far we got along without telling anybody. The only credits on this record are the names of the songs. Yeah. So when you, it's really cool. It says Striker Brothers, and it has these whole faces. And there's no real faces, just like yeah. our heads. Yeah. And you open it up, and there's the little narrative, and you look at the back, and it has the names of the songs, and the, and the, and and on the very bottom it says, "There is no message here, only the music." Right, and that's oh, what it says. Cool. And, and so uh, it came out, and I think it sold about five copies because, like, nobody, <laughs> no, in like the first week, because uh-huh. nobody would. Ha- what this is how no one's ever heard of the striker brothers. Yeah, yeah. So this yeah. is how weird the music business has gotten or tight it's gotten, you right. Nobody would touch it because they couldn't like promote There's no it anyway. Name attached Nothing to it. attached to it. Yeah. So they were really afraid. So we you know, so we started kind of throwing some stuff out there and, and then we had this little concert at our Christmas show. We do this Christmas show every year that runs from almost all of December and we do a different theme and then there's a big set. And this year's called called was it called a Cosmic Cowboy Christmas. Everyone yeah. in the band dresses up. So but this year before the co- and then also we had um uh, uh, shiny ribs opening in for us, and so before shiny ribs, we had a four set show with the Striker Brothers, and we walked out there and we played and we played this song. Uh, and the last song we played was called Charlie Duke took country music to the moon. And Charlie yeah. Duke is an astronaut; he's eighty three years old, and he came out in front of twenty three hundred people, and we finished this song, and we and. And my daughter Clara got Doug Green from the Riders in the Sky to to she wrote up this little thing. It's about a minute and a half about Charlie Duke, and they and it comes out on the PA system with Doug Green's that great big voice, you know, comes out there talks about Charlie Duke. Charlie Duke walks out there on stage. It was really an stunning moment. I mean, it was un I'd never really experienced that whole feeling because he came out there and. I, I'm skeptical of patriotism. You know, I'm like, I don't know if, you know, what this is or what this is, right? But I want to say that was the closest thing that I'd ever had to have a real patriotic moment because yeah. this guy walks out on stage, the the yeah. only astronaut left that had walked on the moon, right? Yeah. And everybody stood up and everybody just kept clapping and clapping and clapping until he walked off the stage. Man, and he cool. saluted the crowd. It was so fantastic. <laughs> so... The Stryker Brothers, you know, if we did anything really, really cool, and this, I have to give the, Randy credit because he was the guy who ran into, he ran into uh, Charlie Duke and call, called me and said, I want to write a song called Charlie Duke Took Country Music to the Moon. We have to go lunch with him and talk to him, and then we'll write this song. And that's exactly what we did. Wow. So that was, so that was a big moment, and Charlie Duke Took Country Music to the Moon actually is, is a pretty cool song. It's like a country blues song, uh-huh. you know? And uh, it was, you know, if if we did, if, if, if nothing else, we did that. And that whole Charlie Duke moment was uh, a lifelong memory for me. That was cool. That okay. was, that was awesome. Do you, I, so I'm, we're 
we're pretty much done. I have a few final, like, kind of goofy questions that sure. I like to ask. Uh, sure. You, you have any jokes? Yeah, I heard one today. You want to hear it? Yeah. Okay, so this guy says calls his friend, says, you got to come over here. And he says, okay. So he goes over there, and it opens. And the guy opens the door, and this guy's got this giant pumpkin head. And, they, and he's going, my God, what happened? He says, well, I found this. I found a, a a a lantern, you know, and I rubbed it like people do, and the genie popped out, and the, and the genie said, "You have three wishes," and I said, "Well, uh, first wish I'd like a, a hundred billion dollars," and boom, I had a hundred billion dollars. Says, Second wish, I said, I, "I want the most beautiful girl in the world." And boom, there she was, and then the th third wish, I don't know what happened. I totally blew it, and I said, "I want a huge pumpkin head." <laughs> 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 the, the more absurd the better for me yeah, and yeah. jokes yeah. i mean i love absurd jokes so that one was like boy that one rang the bell for me i loved that <laughs> um yeah uh give, give me some of your deserted island albums Are you familiar with that sort of yeah, concept sure. oh absolutely mm -hmm. Ab yeah. absolutely um Chicken Skin Music, uh, Ry Cooter's record. The first record uh, that uh, David Grisman, the David Grisman Quintet, mm -hmm. would be uh, uh, one of my all-time favorites. Um, I don't know, pick a Lightning Hopkins record. I, 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 I like them all. There's one that's kind of, there's a live one that I really probably played the most. Uh, Willis Allen Ramsey's <laughs> one and only record. Would be a really good good record, uh, and um, uh, and, uh, and and I love Sade. Okay, so the, those are those are kind of kind of you know the the spread basically. Yeah, mm -hmm. you might have just answered one of my other questions, which is uh, <laughs> give me a band that you listen to that might surprise people. Ah, well, that was you know I, I you know you think you, you think in this business some of this business is about fantasy so you think like well you know if I say this enough maybe it'll happen I always say they say well who would you like to do like a duet with and I always say Sade you know <laughs> and so so that would be one of my one of the uh -huh. ones that I would love to but you know I would uh, something like. Uh, Man, actually, actually get to play the guitar like the electric guitar, uh, like with somebody like the Iguanas, and just like, just like you know, jam out on that kind of swamp bluesy stuff, man. Yeah. I mean, I'm no good at it, but I would love to do it. Right? Yeah, I would just right. love to just be right yeah. in the middle of all that, and just you know, hanging yeah. on it. You know? That's I mean, I don't you. Not to take anything away from them, but I don't think you have to be that good because no, it gets it's a little trashy. Yeah, you know? no, it's trashy, and that. But I mean, I love the way they kind of you know. If you go, I've only been to a couple of their shows, and that. And if you go there, they kind of find this really groove that I just like is really cool, and I just let. And you know, like if I pull out an electric guitar with my band. Everybody goes, what are you doing? And I go, I'm just like, I thought I'd play electric guitar. Yeah. Hey, no, man, hey, you know, I can play whatever you want me to play. I can play, if you want me to play electric guitar and this stuff, I said, no, I just want to play my own electric guitar. Yeah. No, wait, you know, you should play the acoustic guitar. It really sounds more full with it. I'm like, Oh, they don't want me to play the electric <laughs> guitar. So yeah, so that you know, get. I mean, the iguanas I pick because I, I I I've heard them and I've thought that a couple of times. But you know, pick any just badass blues band and I I'm all in on it. And yeah. it's like I just went wah, wah, hang on it. That would be it. Um, is there a movie or a TV show that you've been thinking about lately, or it doesn't even have to be the last thing you saw? Just or it can be. Well, okay, I'll t tell you what I did get into re re recently. Uh, uh, other than Game of Thrones, I'd hate to I'd hate to just pass up the fact that, yeah. like, it was one of those ones yeah. that I yeah I just became a fan. So, but and I've watched it uh, too many times and all that business. But uh, I did what I did do uh, really recently was I got in, into um, watching all of Humphrey Bogart's movies, and I and I just. And I was just digging out, you know, every, everyone the, from the, you know, the, the, the like the big sleep, uh -huh. you know, of course, the Casablanca, but, yeah. Blanca, but like things like Sabrina and then uh, African Queen. Right. And, and Treasure I, of the Sea Air Madre. Absolutely. Treasure of the Sea Air Madre is just, you know, uh, just a great piece. And I, I, 
I don't know why I got kind of so attracted to what he did, you know, but I really came to I came to really appreciate him because he was really brave because I mean like the treasure see Aaron Madres he's a really weak character I mean he's a as a person he's a really weak person and like to do that to have the like the guts to actually you know be that kind of scumbag you know to shoot your own partner and everything yeah, is like right. You know, wow! It's, and then you get into like the uh, um, uh, the the cane mutiny, and yeah. it's just like, wow! How you know he he got you know by the time the the end of his life, you know he was he he tried everything in acting, right? I mean he he really, and he started out being just like the first you know a lister, leading man, love interest, right? Yeah, and and he became a guy that just you know, get everything. And I, and I thought, how cool, you know, this guy really took his career and just did what he wanted to do. Yeah. Man, Robert, I think that about wraps it up. Thank you. Thank I really you so much it. for your time. Yeah, I really I appreciate re everything. I re really enjoyed it. And, uh, uh, you know, and really happy to be part of the Bags family because uh, they've done done us right all these years. You know, no questions asked ever. Just you know, we call up and say we need this or something, and they always helped us out. So it's yeah. been it's been a really great great partnership for us. Thanks so much, man. Yeah, my pleasure. Friend of Jesus, tall and trim. Deep in old town beside the city jail The unknown fighter steps into the gym Takes his corner and listens for the bell Someday very soon the world will know his name He feels with every punch he's landing Another uppercut, another man goes down, down to the ground, he's still standing. Dockside warehouse has seen better nights The unknown fighter steps into the ring It don't matter, his name is not in lights Someday very soon the world will know his name It feels with every punch he's landing That was Robert Earl Keane with the previously unreleased The Unknown Fighter, featuring Bill Whitbeck on upright bass 
and Kim Warner on mandolin. I'd like to say thank you again to Robert. It was an honor and a pleasure to hear you play your songs and share your stories. Be sure to check out all of Robert Earl Keane's LR Bags handcrafted video session at lrbags.com or the LR Bags YouTube channel. And as always, thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time on Maker's Mike.